I'm Jim Carlson and live from the Gallup Studios here in Omaha, Nebraska. This is Gallup's Theme Thursday, Season 3, recorded on May 18th, 2017. Theme Thursday is a Gallup webcast series that dives deep into the Clifton Strengths Finders themes one at a time, and today's theme is Maximizer. If you have questions, comments, or contributions during this webcast, we do have a live chat room that's available for you right below the main video window. So just if you're watching live or even the recorded version on our um, on our blog live page, just look below the video window down there. There's a chat room. We'd love to have you log in. Bottom left-hand corner is the login button. Choose the guest account. Put your name in where it says guest. Hit submit and you're in. We will take questions live during the program. If you're listening to the recorded version or have questions about custom strengths coaching solutions for small, medium, or large organizations, we do that as well. You can send us an email. Contact us at coaching at gallup.com. Don't forget to visit the Gallup Strength Center, just gallupstrengthcenter.com for all your Clifton Strengths coaching resources and training needs. You can also catch the video on both streaming and now downloadable audio for offline listening. The best way to catch us oftentimes is out walking the dog, out for a run, when you're in a car, in a train, in a plane, one of those things, you can download those to your phone and listen to them offline as well. So all those options are available on our resources page. Head over to coaching.gallup.com. Micah Librant is our host today. She works as a workplace consultant here at Gallup. And Micah, always great to have you on a theme Thursday and welcome back. Thanks, Jim. Great to be here. Today's going to be super fun. I'm excited to talk about Maximizer, and I love all of our guests, but I think we're going to get an especially fun kick out of our guest today. <laughs> it is going no to be... No, no pressure, Jim. No pressure. So, no Jim, pressure. sit tight for just a second. Micah, we need to uh, we need to work on sorting and learning about Maximizer, so uh, why don't we dig in off the companion guide? Sure. So we're about halfway through those influencing themes. We get to talk about Maximizer today. Maximizer is about being pretty picky. It's about this awareness of and pursuit of perfection. Uh, and I'll make no apologies for that because I've met a lot of people who use this in a fantastic way. If you take a look at our companion guide, you'll take a look at the, the long definition. A few things I want to pull out for you so that we can all truly understand <clears throat> Maximizer. For me, the most interesting nugget of this is a couple sentences here. Taking something from below average to slightly above average takes a lot of effort and to a maximizer is not all that rewarding. Transforming something strong into something superb also takes a lot of effort. In fact, could be the same amount of elbow grease and effort, but for a maximizer, that is thrill, that is joy, that is exactly where they want to be. So really, maximizer is about noticing what's good and imagining what other, people's don't, what other people maybe don't see on how it could be better. It's about that relentless pursuit of um, improvement, uh, pursuit of, uh, of high expectations, and about helping people understand that what we might think is good and move on can always be improved Upon. We often use the term polishing the pearl. So it is also, it's a, it's a thrill and uh, I think a willingness to look for areas of strength because you can maximize them. Very often we lump in the idea of focusing on strengths to maximize there, although I think that could probably be applied across all 34. But specifically in this long definition, you'll notice things like the natural sorting of strengths means that others may see you as being a very discriminating person when you've got high maximizer. You're attracted to people who seem to have found and cultivated their own strength. You tend to avoid those who want to fix you or avoid those who think that um, the goal should be to be well-rounded. Uh, you really instead would prefer to, to sharpen those areas that you're already uh, great in and, and think about the, the infinite potential that exists in areas of strength. You don't want to spend your life bemoaning what you lack. Rather, you want to capitalize on the gifts with which you already have. It's more fun. It's more productive. And counterintuitively, it's more demanding. And I think Maximizer does have quite a bit of um, effort and, and energy behind it that really can say, when, when I'm focusing on an area that is worthy and that has a, that can, that's already working, I can see how it can work even better. And, and I, can, I can see what that looks like. So let's talk about what Maximizer looks like specifically in leaders. I think in great leaders with Maximizer, they use it to influence others. At the onset, think of a, just a project. If you're leading a team through a project, at the onset of that project, it can be seeing improvement in greatness. Think about that. Think about being able to see how something great could get better. That's a vision that a lot of us don't have. <laughs> and at the conclusion of a project, it's stretching the expectations even higher. 
instinctive awareness of really what's best. I think it's um, it's something that you can enhance as a leader by making sure that you are studying top performers, that you're paying attention and gathering information and staying curious about who's the best and what kind of products are the best and what is that transformation process of taking something from good to even better and to best. I also think it's important for for leaders with Maximizer, kind of how do we how do we use this? How do we coach this talent? Think about how do you translate that that upper echelon of performance into your organization. So you might be a huge sports fan and lead an organization that has very little to do with sports, but you're probably studying the very best and you're probably studying maybe a favorite team based on their their turnaround story or their ability to perform. How can you find the links there? How can you find those links and then translate them into a reminder of the value of, of high performance for your organization? I also think in the leaders who I've coached who have high maximizer, it's incredibly important to, to be upfront and talk about expectations uh, for yourself with maximizer. If you're an individual contributor who maybe isn't in charge of, of leading other people, never it, it, you can never be good enough and that can be okay. You can have incredibly high expectations of yourself and that's just how you operate. When you're leading others, that can come across as kind of difficult to follow if they know that, gosh, even if I give you my best, it's just never going to be good enough. It has a very different connotation when you're when you're in charge of other humans. So think about what are you translating in terms of expectations? What does great look like? What does better look like? And, and then I also think it's important just to say, hey, when do we move on? Because there's always going to be something that you can polish again. And I don't want you to hear that as turn down that maximizer. I want you to hear it as there's other things to maximize, which oftentimes can be difficult for folks with maximizer to who can continue to polish until things are better and better and better. Understand that um, if you dwell on that and keep sort of the hamster wheel going, maybe at the end of something when it truly is excellent, you're missing out on other opportunities to turn good into great. Just some personal reflection if you are a leader with Maximizer. Think about how important it is to truly be authentic in leadership, which is why we're even doing all of season three around leadership is this importance of not just knowing your craft, but knowing yourself and being able to translate that to your followers. So if a couple questions I'd, I'd encourage those leaders with Maximizer to think about is, when are you offering your very best? How can you be very picky about the best of yourself that you have to give? When are you conversely stretching into areas that aren't your very best because you think you have to or because you think other people might not do it as well? And who can you surround yourself with in order to truly bring together a team who's all, all working toward excellence? Um, I think that Maximizer has a unique ability to a symbol of a, a brain trust of superheroes because you tend to notice excellence. So pay attention to that and give yourself maybe some grace and some humility by saying, this is where I'm great. This is where I'm less than great. And since I've got those high expectations, maybe that's an opportunity to look for some support systems and some partnership. The final thing I want to talk about before bringing in our guest is those four needs of followers. So Maximizer absolutely can be excellent at cr creating trust, stability, compassion, and hope. I'm going to ask Jim in a moment whether there's any of these that, that feel easier or more linked to Maximizer than others. But let's start with trust. Um, I think you can build trust with Maximizer by admitting your strengths and allowing for partnership. Uh, again, that same sort of authenticity exercise we talked about in, in some personal reflection. And what is the best of use of your talents on this project? And don't let your talent be, I have high expectations, because that'll, that'll, that'll occur across every single project. You're always going to be that person with high expectations. Get specific. Think about your other themes. Think about your skill set. Think about your values. Where can you really be the best? And how can you make sure that you're offering that and you're telling people that that's what they can expect? We talk about compassion. I think um, your high standard of excellence helps you spot potential strengths in other people because you notice what's fantastic. So tr practice being able to translate that into words. Sometimes we talk about talent and it's easy to say, wow, she's really fast or he's exceptionally skilled at some, you know, some technology pieces. I think expand beyond so that you can really have a vocabulary for talking about what people are great at. You could think about asking your question this, um, what area of giftedness does each person bring to the table? Uh, and I think that that's probably a, a place where you might be ahead of the pack naturally. So think about spreading some compassion by helping other people put their their strengths into, into words. 
A leader with Maximizer might provide stability by setting early expectations of your polishing process. So ask yourself when you really should be set up for the final say. Um, should you make sure that you are the last piece in a process instead of the very first? Um, and, and really, what is the best way to do that? And finally, when we talk about hope, my favorite four-letter four letter word, find words for excellence. You're attracted to it. Um, spend time there and help people see what's possible. Help people fall in love with this idea that you have of what would happen if we let go of what's not working. Um, we often talk about maximizer and restorative being very, uh, almost coming from, cut from different cloth. You, you absolutely could have them both, but it would be pretty rare. And restorative, again, is about that attraction to what's broken and, and bringing it back to its uh, its working state. Maximizer, on the other hand, can be an impatience with what's broken. And I think it's important for you to translate that into the possibility that you see if you move beyond beyond that and you focus on what's working. So think about some visioning, some, some future casting and some inspiration that you can give to your followers by helping them see the return on investment of focusing on our areas that are already strong. That's my first page for you. I hope I gave you plenty of notes you can think about with what Maximizer looks like, ideally from just a place of all speaking the same language. Um, we'll tell you with my guest, Jim Asplund here, that's probably the, the the highest stakes guest I've ever had in terms of making sure that that was accurate. <laughs> so without further ado, I want to introduce to you Mr. Strengths himself. So Dr. Jim Asplund is our chief scientist here at Gallup of Strengths Development. He's also the co-author of Human Sigma, one of my favorite Gallup books, uh, Managing the Employee Customer Encounter. And he, he thinks and lives strengths every day. Jim, welcome to the program. Thanks. Great to be here. Hey, Jim, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself, your top five, and uh, a little bit about your Maximizer? Sure. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I assure you that only 20% of the employees at Gallup are named Jim. Um, <laughs> we, we set a hard cap on that now. Um, actually, it's a, it, it's a name I don't think shows up in a lot of younger guys. So I think it'll work itself out. But anyway, um, I've been at Gallup for well, going on 19 years now. Um, and I've been doing the running the strengths R and D since two thousand five, two thousand six, somewhere in there. Uh, most of it, anyway. And um, other top, other top four themes are analytical, ideation, individualization, and strategic. And um, so, you know, my job here at Gallup has has evolved over the years, but for the most part, uh, Micah had it, you know, kind of nailed it with the. Uh, I'm kind of responsible for what Strengths Finder means. You know, what questions we ask. Um, making sure that the themes, you know, have uh, psychometric heft and, and value and validity and and uh, testing, you know, kind of different ways to use strengths and stuff like that. I also have kind of a uh, uh, another job at Gallup where I work with some clients and do some other kind of R&D that's outside the strength space, um, pre predominantly around sort of um, uh, predictive modeling. You know, I do a lot of math. Uh, that's my favorite thing. And so, you know, I'll, I'll cram that into anything I can as, you know, kind of in the theme of the day here in terms of maximizing. Um, and so a given day for me uh, involves either, you know, doing a lot of math or writing about it and or talking about it. And uh, and often, uh, more often than not, it has a strengths content loaded in there with it. I'm so thankful that somebody loves math because I think you make my job a lot better. I can just do the, the writing about it and the talking about it because I trust the math that you've done and loved. So thanks for that. <laughs> Tell us about Maximizer. What's it look like for you in your role? I did a very dumb thing and left my cell phone on. Sorry about that. Sorry. Right. And uh, um, well, at Gallup, it's a it's a great place to have it because uh, you can uh, do all the things you talked about, and and people understand that, and also um, deal with some of the ramifications of of what that can mean to some people who don't have it. Um, so um, I work in a team of researchers. Um, I do some research on my own. I work with some other guys. Uh, most of those people have been around here a long time too. And so uh, it, when you talk about the four needs of followers, um, I think three of those, at least in my life, are a lot easier than the other one. Um, uh, I, I totally, uh, at least in my experience on a daily basis, the, how you talked about hope in terms of seeing the future and understanding how to push things in a better direction, that I feel that every day. Um, not just, you know, kind of what I'm trying to say to people or what they're saying to me, but kind of how we collectively work on on uh, making strengths finder as good as it can be and how people use it as good as it can be. Um, compassion, again, you know, working on a team 
it's very natural for me at least to and part of this is probably the individualization piece coming in but very easy for me to kind of ask people what do they want to do and because you know from my point of view i don't want them doing something they don't want to do if i can avoid it because i don't feel like making them miserable because i would be miserable i i found you know i'm 52 years old i think i found at this point i just basically won't do things i don't want to do um and so um i mean occasionally but not for more than a couple hours right and um and so i think you know that compassion piece comes somewhat naturally um and i think again you know especially with people we've worked with for a long time the trust thing is pretty easy to because it's easy to open up about you know what, what you want to do and where you think you fit and where you think they fit and have them either agree with you or not but at least move it forward stability is a, is a tricky one though um uh i think you know in my experience you know again working as part of a team with people i know really well that's easy because we all kind of already know where we're going to slot right you know i'm going to do this and you're going to do that and we're both going to be happy and when we're done it's going to look like this and we can work that out pretty quickly um i'm working on a project right now with some some people who are newer um, in a very different skill sets than mine and um and i can kind of see where it's going to go and so even there you can see where it's going to get stable even if it's not yet but there is a sort of a micro thing about maximizer in terms of stability that can drive people a little crazy at least in my experience you know that sort of uh, never satisfied aspect of it where you're kind of always tinkering with things um or you know realizing that this is or, automatically assuming this is a step in a long-term process that's really never going to end um and uh and i know that bothers some people and makes them uncomfortable um in terms of uh like i work with a lot, i work with a lot of it you know uh, uh, guys software guys and you know at some point you got to decide when you're done so that they can actually do their job um and i'm terribly annoying at kind of not ever saying we're done <laughs> even when i mean done for now i and i'll say that but they look at me like yeah he doesn't mean it and uh <laughs> he's gonna change things again and i'm gonna be right back here where i am confused and mad and uh and so it's, it's an interesting kind of thing and and um and I, I actually i learned that at a very young age i grew up on a farm um where you know that sort of i think this point of view for me at least it really crystallized um you know my my, my my grandfather was the farmer. My dad had a job worked on some. So I was I spent every day in the summer and after school and kind of on weekends with my grandfather, who'd been farming for at that point, you know, 60 years, 50 years, and uh, fairly set in his ways <laughs> about how things were done. And most of the stuff we were doing every day didn't really need to be done. He just wanted to do it, and 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 felt like that's the way to do it. But I was always saying, like, "Why do we do it this way? Why can't we do it this way?" And um, and even if he would let me do it my way, then I would change it again the next day, and it would irritate him because it's like you know what I did for you know the last fifty years seemed to work just fine, um, and well, I think he couldn't relate until later that that was just me trying to uh, make it interesting <laughs> instead of just doing what I was told. Um, and so some of it, some of this sort of personality uh, trait or theme, can be around um, finding your spot. Um, and it has nothing to do with maybe what's the best way to do things, but what's the best way to do something for you? Um, and where do you feel more, more comfortable? How do you uh, make it an enjoyable enough experience to do the things that you talked about in terms of honing things and, and working on them and making them better? If you're gonna, if you're gonna work on something a lot and practice something, you wanna make it uh, uh, the experiential piece of that as enjoyable as possible, at least I do. And, um, and so in my work, uh, either on my own or with others, um, that stability piece can be a bit more difficult to manage than the rest of it um, in terms of my effect on other people. Um, and I'm, I'm, ha I'm learning that. Um, it's a work in progress. And, and luckily, as a person with Maximizer, everything is a work in progress. So I'm good with that. Um, <laughs> and and uh, uh, so that, that part is, uh, it can be entertaining on a daily basis, I guess. I love that phrase, everything is a work in progress. Does that, does that mean that you're just constantly discontent? I think I'm a pretty happy guy, but you know, I, I, I'm, uh, I've, I've early on in my life, probably. Yeah. Um, until you, you learn, um, and, and you know, I've got uh, kids in their teens and twenties now. And so I'm kind of watching this from afar. My, in fact, my oldest has restorative, so it's just a totally different, wow. you know, <laughs> view. um, tutoring math in the Chicago public schools. And that seems to really be a good fit, um, right now. And so, um, 
but you know, you learn life is long. You know, I guess you know when you look in the rearview mirror and realize all the things that have happened. And uh, we were, you know, we were talking before this that I'm, I'm going to my 30, 30th college reunion here shortly, and you know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of miles on those tires now. But um, so you know, you learn that uh, to have a longer time horizon. I guess you know, I started doing karate or taekwondo. It's kind of a mix about three years ago, and I'm not very good at it. Um, but the idea that I'm just going to keep doing it because it's good for me. And every time I go, I get a little bit better. Um, so that is, I'm kind of violating that principle that I'm taking something good and making it excellent because I'm not remotely good. Um, I'm okay. But, uh, <laughs> but the idea that it's something to work on and it's going to be always a work in progress actually makes me feel good. Um, you know, that, 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 that it's not, you know, lots of people join and get their black belt and just quit. I, have, I, have, I don't have that opinion about what I'm going to do. I'm just going to keep doing it because it's good for me. And it gives focus to my day or my week in a way that helps me. Um, uh, and, and so that idea of being a work in progress actually makes me happy. I'm, I'm good if I'm in a spot where I can just keep doing things that last a long time. And in the world we're in today, there are fewer and fewer opportunities for that in work, you know, where you work on the same thing for years. Um, I love that about my job, that I can just, the fact that it's never done means I've always got something interesting to do. So it's, it's, if you think about kind of how not, not being satisfied is it's uh, that can be a great thing. Um, cause the idea that we're ever done is just, I don't even think that exists and, and to, to a certain extent. And so that means I got something cool to do every day. Um, as opposed to, uh, some people, you know, where, where I get frustrated actually is if I have to task switch on things where I don't feel like I'm in the position to do that. Um, and where I'm not on something long enough to really see where I can really refine it. Um, that can be really frustrating to me. And, um, and I'm sure frustrating to the people I'm working with because they can feel that in, in, in the questions I ask and the things I say and all the context I need to even feel comfortable at that point. I'm hearing something about Maximizer in you that I don't think I totally understood until this moment. And that is, you mentioned earlier, it's not necessarily about the right way to do things, but that heightened awareness of what's right for you. And I think maybe sometimes we read that, we read into that as the ability to help everybody else focus on their strengths. But maybe it comes from a place of just that understanding of when things are in flow and when they're not and a desire to spend time where you know that you can do your best. Can you talk a little bit about that? Am I on the, on the right page? No, I, I absolutely agree. Um, I think, you know, if, if you're kind of blessed or cursed with this theme or however you want to put it, um, <laughs> you know, it's mostly good. Uh, you have a visceral sense of what it's like to be working on something that you like, you know, and I, I think I feel bad. A lot of people, I, I'm not sure they do. Um, and uh, for me, it's always been a real strong impulse, you know, and, um, and I can usually tell real quickly if I'm going to like something or not. More importantly, if I'm going to, even if I'm, even if I don't know if I like it yet, I know whether I'm going to like finding out if I like it or not. <laughs> and so, um, and, and I may not be any good at that thing, right? Mind you, like I, I am, um, I always wanted to play the drums as a kid and my mother very cleverly tried to steer that in another direction by getting the neighbor kid to teach me how to play the guitar and, um, which he did and I enjoyed it. I still play. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I ended up talking to her to let me play the drums and, um, and I, so now I had two ways to annoy her. In, in the house growing up. Um, but the interesting difference was I was just way better at the drums. And so it was much easier to make myself practice. So the guitar became kind of an avocation for me where I would sit around and noodle around and have a little fun when I, when I didn't want to annoy everyone. But the one I really liked working on was the drums because I was better at it and the feedback was better um, and it felt more natural. Um, but I still liked doing both of them. Um, but that maximizer thing really kicked in way more with the one that I was I was getting better feedback in terms of being improving faster at. Um, and so I think, you know, that there's that, again, that sort of existential or experiential feeling uh, of, of when that's occurring that I, I luckily have a sense of. And again, I think I, I wonder if, if not everyone does have that and, and it can make it frustrating for them to figure out what they want to do. Did you always know what you wanted to do? Oh, no. I mean, I knew yes and no. So, right. Um, uh, and in fact, I, I find this uh, interesting, and we've done a little research on this with strengths in terms of careers and career pathing, and that it's far from even remotely close to talking about almost. But um, uh, I knew what I liked to do. I just didn't know what, what, who would pay me to do any of those things. So, so you know, I ended up <laughs> doing math because I just kept taking those classes because I liked it. You know, so I kept taking math and physics and, 
and things like that because those are the ones I enjoyed. I, there was no plan. I didn't have a plan. Um, I, it, like I said, I just kept doing the things I liked and then hoped it would turn into something, <laughs> which luckily it did. Um, but uh, so in terms of always knowing what I want to do, uh, yes and no. Um, and, uh, in comparison to, say, my sister, who's a concert pianist, who, you know, at the age of like four had already made up her mind that that was it. You know, but again, I think it probably I haven't actually ever talked to her about this, um, but it probably proceeded from a similar place where it just she enjoyed doing it so much. She's like, uh, this is it. I'm, I'm here. I, I'm going to do this and we'll let the we'll figure out how that works later. Yeah, you know, Mike is good. Say, say, Jim and Micah, same for me, you know, Maximizer 3. I'm constantly I like I never really knew what I was going to do. I just kept doing things until I found what I really liked in them. And if I didn't like it, I moved on to the next thing. And it yeah. was just kind of this experiment of making things better. Every job, even here at Gallup in the 10 years I've been here, you know, I started as a peer IT manager when I got here. But as we began to move along, it was like, oh, hey, recruiting sounds fun. Let's give that a try. And so we moved into that role. Jim, I've, and, you know, vice, you know, and then we webcast and some of the other things. Jim, I've worked with you a little bit, even through some resources where we've, you know, take a look at the data and then how do we, how do we make this data better? Like, how do we, how do we continue to find new things? And, and, and really that's a lesson in a lot of the research that we do, right? We, even with StrengthsFinder, it was a long journey to get this tool here and we still continue to discover things through people and reports and stuff that we do and the, the work that we have. Oh. Yeah, I mean, it's just an amazing, it's a, for hey, us, Don maximizers. Clifton did decades of work while you and I were playing Little League baseball and <laughs> yeah. wearing yeah. mullets and doing who knows what, you know, all that time. And, and, and uh, yeah, that was a long road. You know, we're, we're lucky to be sitting on top of the hill now with the benefit of all that work. But, um, but yeah, it took Jim, a long time. And you're working with some of our senior scientists here at Gallup. And that's a, you know, that's a, those, that's a pretty heady group that we have there. There's a bunch of smart PhDs. Um, in that group. As you think about the contribution you bring as a leader among that, and then specifically as you think about Maximizer playing in that leadership circle that you have with them, what's the valuable contribution you bring to that group using Maximizer the best? How would you say you're, you you really maximize that? I hate, you know, you're not supposed to use the word in the definition. Don't, but don't use the word. Don't use the can, you, um, uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, well, at the risk of, of, of slightly contradicting something I said earlier to Micah's question, um, never satisfied, it, it, that part's kind of true, but it's not, I don't view it as a negative thing. Um, so I'm the, I poke holes at things. Um, I'm the one who's like, why do we do that? Um, uh, why do we keep doing it that way? Can't we do it this way? Even if, uh, even if I know why, I want to hear people say it because <laughs> I want to know what the reasons are and did we reevaluate that and and are we constantly kind of doing the best job we can do? Because um, it's easy, you know. I I've noticed and you know it's funny. Um, most of us we have some younger guys now, but you know the the the, the group of people I work with are mostly around my age, um, and so you know you, you get to where it's good to have some of the younger guys we have now because. They learn things a different way. Their their relationship with data is just different. Um, the way they interact with people uh, in the client kind of space is just different, and that's great because it forces us to rethink a lot of these things. So I don't, I'm not the only one having to do that all the time, and I'm, I'm not saying I am, but I'm the one that's most li likely to do it. Um, and I, the way I explain it to people who aren't familiar with things, I just tell them, you know, I just I don't trust things, and I'm easily bored, and so I need to be constantly reminded why are we doing it this way. Um, I mean, just like my, I've got to tear down my old deck because it's rotten and my kid and I are out there with the sawzall and the sledgehammer and, and you know we're coming up with like 19 ways to tear down the deck you know just to see which ones by the time we figure out the best way to do it we'll be done right so it'll be point it's a pointless exercise but sometimes you just can't stop yourself it's a fun and, exercise uh, though right you find yourself drawn to it and it is fun it makes it entertaining and interesting yeah. and so in this group of people that, that we, you know the researchers there's half dozen of us who work a lot together um we, um, you know, we have a couple of guys who have a lot of focus. You may have noticed I don't really have any, um, you know, so their job is to keep us on track. And my job is, kind of, and, you know, across uh, content areas, because obviously there's content areas where one of us knows way more than the other ones or way less. And so you kind of have to either just lead because you're the one who knows the content or shut up because you don't. Um, 
but um, and there's people with different skill differences. Like I do a lot more math. We have other people who are better at say coding, and you know we have other people who are better at say writing items. Um, and some of us do kind of all those things, but we know who really who's the best at those. And so you know you get a sense of that pretty easily amongst ourselves. Um, but I think you know from the my standpoint of being the probably the highest. The, uh, Maximize is more common at Gallup than it is most places I've been. Uh, I mean, so it's it's not like I'm the only one in there who's like this. Um, I'm probably the most like this. Uh, but where you're just kind of constantly saying we can do better, um, and maybe we can't, but it's good to ask even if you don't, even if you find out the answer is no, you can't. Or, or yes, but that 1% will cost you 98% of people ever taking the thing because it's too long or things like that that you just kind of have to work yourself through. Jim, in a, in a group, you mentioned, you know, there, we have a lot of maximizers here at Gallup. And when you get maximizers together, there can be a clash of conflict sometimes. Uh, knowing that, you know, you and I are in that, both in that same, same boat. How do you think, or what have you found the most successful ways to manage those, maybe those conflicts of, of maximization that's going on, even when an idea is, and maybe in leadership, you get some strong leaders who have some strong ideas, and then they're both coming at this from a different perspective. What have you learned in your leadership to, to help kind of mitigate that? <laughs> there's sort of, a, it's funny, at least the, the people I work with, there's sort of a meta understanding of this because we're actually studying, you know, cognitive biases and, 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 uh, and, and logic errors and things like that. So we actually get in these weird sort of infinite regressions where we're arguing about how we're arguing about how we're arguing. But, um, uh, but you know, uh, one thing, if you're paying attention you know over the years that you know this guy uh, usually has the right answer or this guy is the most realistic and so you kind of learn to wait you know those responses if you're if you you know so for us it's we're cheating because we know each other so well um, so uh, they know that I have to say 10 crazy things to get one really good one out um, and, um, I, and and that's okay you know they put up with that now um, and I know that the fact that one of them hasn't said anything for a half an hour doesn't mean he isn't listening. <laughs> it's just it's just processing, 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 processing. But some people might sit there and go, geez, is he awake? And, uh, <laughs> and, and yeah, absolutely, yes, because in about 30 minutes in, he'll say some totally brilliant thing that will crystallize everything that's just happened. Um, and so, you know, that that's the cool part, you know, of, of, of working with people you know is that that maximization dueling kind of takes care of itself. Um, in a team that's kind of more ad hoc, like I'm working with on a client team or, or outside partners or somebody we don't know very well, um, you, you run into a certain amount of that. But um, I've, I've learned over the years, at least for myself, um, that if you step out of the way first um, and let people kind of do their thing, um, they'll usually give you time to do that too. Not always, but usually. Um, and you might find that you don't need to after they're done. Um, but that... Um, for the most part, I found it much easier to deal with that situation than when I'm the only one in the room who wants to do it. So, for example, if you've got nine people maximizing something, we may argue about how, but our goal is still, you know, kind of similar. Um, if you're the only one in there working with nine people who don't want to change anything ever, that gets, for me, that gets really old and really frustrating. Um, and I understand that that's a comfort zone for some people, and for some things in life, that's the right thing to do. Um, you don't want the navigator when they used to have those on the airplane uh, to just start making up a new route to Detroit. You know, I mean, don't do that. That's dangerous. But um, but in the situations we're in, we're in meetings and stuff. You know, arguing about things, I, even that can get really old. And so I actually find it way more frustrating for myself being in a room where I'm the only one doing it, as opposed to seven or eight people arguing over how to do it. Because that's ultimately a resolvable situation you know even if you did the math on the game theory of how that would work out you know you could see that there's an end that you will arrive at that's op suboptimal but optimal enough for people whereas if you're everyone else is you know zero and you're a one you know that can be really hard to get things moving thanks for the math answer that was fantastic <laughs> i think i followed that i think he just, <laughs> he just cyborg um but uh, uh i think we, that it's a uh, I think what I think what you just said though is like it, you just lean further into that maximizer. You pay attention yeah. to what other people do really well, and then you leverage that, right? You <laughs> you use what you're paying attention to. Well, you need to understand that it's not natural for most people, and and uh, and be sympathetic to the fact that it, that's hard for them. Just like uh, for me, 
you know, I would have made a horrible accountant because, you know, the, the, the sort of, you know, day-to-day -day kind of regularity, I would, I would be miserable. Um, but I'm sure glad some people like it because uh, we all live on the grace of their making everything work out, right? So, um, so I think the, the overall understanding that we all have our own strengths and our own ways of doing things, you know, that's a huge advantage uh, in being in those frustrating situations to know that, okay, that's just me. You know, remember, you know, I'm not the one that has to write the code and make sure everything works after I'm blathering on about how we can make it better. Um, let's try to make it a little easier for them or at least give them some more time to work through it. Micah, there's a question in chat. I want to throw this to you first, and then, Jim, I want you to answer how you think you'd see this. But there is a tendency, when is enough enough? This has been asked a couple times in chat. Like, as maximizers, you know, we're always talking about making it better and, and improving or sorting or improving, those kinds of things. Micah, when we think about from a coaching perspective and we're coaching leaders, how do we, how, as, as maximizers, how do we get to that point when, or can we, or should we, recognize that point when okay enough let we have to we have to push forward and move on can you talk a little bit about that i noticed that one of the ways it was phrased in that chat room was how do you keep maximizer from getting burned out yeah. and i think maybe it doesn't would be my thought <laughs> the very nature of maximizer is that you can keep going and you but know you may burn anybody, people out around you though with that that comment. might be yeah. it. that might be yeah. a little bit maybe what we're what we're really maybe afraid to say there is are we burning yeah. other people out and i think any great coaching needs to be rooted not just in self-awareness but in performance right so you need to know yourself but you absolutely at its core have to be paying attention to what you're creating you know what what kind of numbers are you are you delivering what kind of effect are you having on other people what's the end goal so regardless of what your theme is i think you've got to root it in some outcomes and maybe maybe you're burning other people out. My my hunch, and I'll ask Jim on this one. I'll, I'll throw it to you next, Jim. Is no, we're, Michael, we're losing you just a little bit. If stop for one second, ask that question again for Jim because I oh, I didn't hear it. Hey Jim, my um my my hunch is maybe Maximizer doesn't burn out in the same way that we're thinking it will. That that when is enough enough? Because maybe the answer is it's it's just not, and that's the beauty of Maximizer. Uh, but but what would you say? How would you react to that? Well, I, I, I have kind of two minds on it. Um, I think in general you're right. It, it, it's not a problem for those of us with it, um, depending on your time horizon. Um, uh, we were talking earlier, you know, I'm, I'm a big basketball junkie and, you know, the guys who are really good, they never stop practicing, right? They never, they never take a day off. They go in and they shoot their hundred free throws in a row and they go and shoot their thousand shots from three point range. And they, they go and they do that. They never take their foot off the gas. That part never gets old. Um, and so if you think about it as improvement or practice, you know, that part doesn't get old. And, and, but that's, there's a longer time horizon there. You know, if you took a day off, would it really affect you tomorrow? Probably not. But if you started taking days off, pretty soon it would affect the whole thing. Um, so I think, you know, in the macro sense, it's not an issue for those of us with it. Uh, it, it in the micro sense, it can be in the sense that, you know, you got to get done. You, the things due Thursday um, uh, is the answer functional. Um, I'm fine turning that off. I mean, you know, that's life. You know, that that's, uh, you know, I got 10 other problems I can work on that will chew up my need to ruin people's days um <laughs> and you know if the and if i find you know the math thing helps right if i find the answer seven you know i mean i can find you nine other ways to come to the answer seven and i'm in my head that might be entertaining to do but i'm not going to burden anybody else with that um now um if you're a leader of a team and you're the only one with maximizer you might need to be sensitive to the pace of things right so like i said you know we live in a world where Things change faster. I mean, I've got, I sound like an old man. I'm pretty soon I'm going to be yelling at the kids to get off my lawn. But, <laughs> but you know, for those of us who experience it on a daily basis, we all know what we're talking about. Um, you know, the, the things are moving faster. You got to adapt more and to more things and at a higher speed than we used to have to do. It's frustrating enough for people. You don't need to just add to it by just changing stuff that doesn't need changing just because you're bored. You know, I mean, it, you, you can find other ways to maybe occupy your head to do that. Um, if you see a real need, you know, make the case and find a resources to put it together to do that. And, and um, you know, my little brother's a school superintendent. And, um, and, you know, part of the hard part of that job is, you know, not seeing where you need to take the district, what direction you need to go, but 
getting everybody else to figure that out <laughs> and agree with you and then actually make it happen. You know, so you have to have an understanding. I mean, I have, he has way more patience than I do, so I could never do that, but um, uh, who knows, but I, I'm pretty sure I couldn't. And, but you know, he's, he's got to talk to the community and meet with people and talk again and meet with them. You know, he knew what they, were, what they should have done two years ago, or he was pretty sure of it. And maybe two or three other people did too, but you know, you can't do it alone. Um, and so, you know, part of the max, you can, you can entertain yourself with the vision, you know, that can chew up some of the need to kind of improve things is to refine how you explain that and how you encourage people to do that. It doesn't have to always be, I'm doing it right now. Um, the, uh, you know, I, I, like I said, I grew up on a farm and I had a lot of time to myself and you spend, have a lot of time to think. Um, and I used to think I'm a Cub fan. So, you know, and my picture this in the seventies, how awful they were every year. Uh, for those who don't like sports, I just apologize for this, but um, I would spend my time thinking, what could the Cubs do to get better? I mean, even just that was a way to pass the time while I'm walking up and down the bean field. And um, even that helped kind of feed that impulse. You know, how do you improve things? Even if I have zero influence over it or ability to do anything about it, that that's a it's a fun little entertainment that you can you can divert yourself a little bit. I think to if you're sensitive to driving other people crazy, uh, but you can absolutely burn people out. Um, doing it that way. I've experienced that. Uh, I'm making that mistake. Um, but uh, burning myself out, pretty hard to do. I love that. I hear, I hear such a good amount of that strategic too, of just the what if and then what and how could this work? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about why Maximizer lands in that influencing domain? And maybe you know when you've noticed that your Maximizer was able to help other people get to a different place? Um. Uh, well, I'll give you two answers. Everything's a two today. Um, the reason it's in the influence of the domain is math. Um, <laughs> so Thanks for one, that. <laughs> so just in case people didn't know, um, it was an a empirical result. You know, it wasn't like we sat down and tried to decide. Uh, although we did take a pass at that, Tom, Rath, and, and, and Brian, Rem, and I, and a couple other people uh, argued about some of them. Uh, we didn't really argue that hard about this one because it feels right in addition to the math being right. Um, I'll tell you, for me, um, uh, in terms, of it, it is the probably the theme that makes me do something um, more than the other ones. Uh, you know, um, uh, analytical, you know, uh, you can analyze stuff. I mean, doing something in the sense of moving other people around. Um, my number one theme is analytical, and anyone who's known me for five minutes will figure that out. Um, and that can be, uh, uh, I can entertain myself with that almost endlessly to the point of which I don't do anything. And um, and so it's more about input, you know, and so that maximizer is my big output theme or strategic or my, or my big output theme in the sense that those motivate me to ask somebody else, why are we doing this? How can we do this? Um, why aren't you doing that while I'm doing this? You know, to sort of make the best use of our time. That's, for me, that's more my action. And so in terms of influencing others, um, I think you work on any team, um, uh, in terms of slotting people into who should do what, um, you know, that's just, you know, it's the textbook definition of influencing. <laughs> and so, um, uh, and so in my life, it's the one that gets me, you know, interacting with other people more than the other ones, probably. I like that. I, there's a couple questions floating around the chat here about, um, again, how do you make sure that the two sides of, of a leader with Maximizer, one is your, your best is never good enough. Um, I, I don't hear that as much in real life as I do maybe the other side of, wow, you've got more to give, which sounds a little bit more supportive. <laughs> how do you how do you make sure that you stay on that side versus um, it may be the danger of, of exuding a higher expectation than anyone can ever reach? Yeah, I mean, it's hard, you know, there's a reason I'm not a coach, you know, because <laughs> there's, you know, maybe there's not enough math, right? <laughs> probably not enough math, but, um, you know, the, the sort of best is never good enough. Um, I think I, I, I can see why some people would infer that uh, sometimes from a, a person who's just never quite satisfied with the way things are. Um, I think, you know, the way you communicate that is it might have more to do with it than the fact that you're communicating it. For example, um, if you can say, you know, hey, what you just did was awesome. And now what you just did, I'm just making this up, but what you did was awesome. Now that we know that, we're in a better position to do this other thing that'd be really cool. So, I mean, part of it is just, you know, uh, con emotional content of things, right? You know, don't, don't just say, that's all right. Uh, why didn't you do that? You know, mm -hmm. I don't care if that's Maximizer or what it is. You know, you're just going to make somebody feel bad. And if, and if that's your intent, you know, 
well done. But um, but uh, I think you know that there, there's no need to uh, position things in such a way that um, you communicate, even though we're only part way along your journey and vision, to then say, you know, make it the glass half empty about the part yeah. you didn't do yet. You know, because you know, again, you know, some of this is just sensitivity about time, and and I, you know. And, you know, I, I think a lot of times we, we have the right intent, but we communicate the wrong urgency or we communicate the wrong uh, reaction. Uh, and, and, and even when we do that, uh, are not self-aware enough to correct ourselves in the moment, like saying, you oh, know, I'm not, I don't mean to say I'm unhappy. This is great. Um, I just hope that, you know, now that we've got this patch done, we can do the next bit. Um, the, uh, it, it, a lot of it can be just a, around awareness of how you in, in affect people. And so if you're open to learning that about yourself, you can correct some of that. I mean, I think the impulse isn't to be miserable all the time that things aren't where you want them to be, but to be happy or enjoy or at least, um, uh, I don't try not to make this emotional, but <laughs> you know, to, 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 to understand that it is uh, that you're never done. And if you can communicate that to people, it can be frustrating for people who want to be done with things. Um, and, and, and you just have to be honest about that. You know, we're just going to have this tension and I, I'm not trying to communicate to you that I didn't like what you did. It's just that for me, um, you know, imagine, you know, if you're like a, my, my, uh, uh, friend of mine's kid is a, is an MD PhD program and, and, you know, you, you ask other kids, you know, what are you doing? Going to grad school, doing this, you know, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I'm hoping to, you know, cure cancer. You know, and, and, and so, you know, the idea that there is a cure, uh, especially with the wide range of cancers there are, is a little nutty. But I, and I think he knows that. But, you know, it's a short answer he gives people. I don't think the idea is everything's going to be done, right? That, you yeah. know, it's just going to be constantly doing research to improve the lives of people living through this and to stop preventing people from getting it. Um, you know, and I don't know if he has maximizer or not. He's, you know, I barely know him. But, um but you know you can't you could frustrate people thinking that you somehow you need to be done you know like when nixon declared war on cancer guess what you know we're still at war um and it's been 45 years and um that doesn't mean we should feel bad about all the things we've accomplished since then um and uh and and yet and yet and have yet to come you know i i i almost i'm gonna go out on a soapbox here and say there's a lot of it sounds like bias of maximizer when people are asking these questions they're using words like harness and and keep it in check and rein it in it, with this fear that you could offend somebody else by having high expectations but if you listen to how jim speaks about his partners and those other senior scientists he speaks about them from a very clear understanding of what they're good at because he spent years paying attention to it and i think that we really need to dive into that side of maximizer versus this this initial bias that that somehow it's incredibly picky it is but that can lead to this beauty of wow you're not done who really wants to be done i mean what's the alternative if if you finish it sounds like you're um, dead to me i mean i'll just to be honest i mean it, i think when i'm done when i'm done is when i'm gonna when i'm dead i'm kind of hoping i'm not done then either but you know <laughs> i guess I, I guess we'll wait and see but um the the uh, but i think you know the the pickiness is is a good way to put it though because but i think you know it, it works both ways i know at least you know in my own case uh the th there are things i really don't like to do and, and and some of those are things i may be not even that bad at you know i i i was a programmer once upon a time i could do it i never liked it um i can do it on a short term basis but a long term basis that's just not who i am i work with guys who love doing that why wouldn't i take advantage of that and ask them Hey, I think you would like to do this part of this. Tell me if I'm wrong. Um, I have high expectations for them on that. I mm -hmm. may not have as high expectations for them on something I should be doing. Um, and so some of this is is no sort of tactical or situational or content driven. You know, I'm, you know, I'm, I I don't. Um, it's it goes back all back to Don Clifton's story about the animals. You know, I mean, it's just you know, I'm not. I'm trying not to ask any fish to jump up and down or or. Uh, uh, you know, uh, cattle to swim here. You know, I can't remember what animals. It's been a while, but um, you know, if you if you do that, everybody wins. Um, and so part of maximizer in my life is is helping uh, myself and other people slot those roles on a given project accordingly. And so then, you know, if you're asking someone to do something they probably enjoy or or are good at or both, um, what's wrong with having high expectations? They probably want you to have high expectations. Um, why would you why would you insult them by telling them you don't think they can do it? I, that doesn't seem very nice to me either. 
Um, and, uh, and, and if they don't get there, you know, guess what, you know, life's full of mistakes. Maybe they got part of the way there and you learn something about that that you can use next time. So Jim, we're kind of bringing this in for a landing with just a few minutes to go, but I want to ask you personally, and I, I struggle with this a little bit and there was a question in chat about it in that, how critical are you on yourself when we think about changes like, for me, every call to coach, every theme Thursday, the second we end this thing, I start thinking about, oh, we could have done this better. We could have done that better, right? Every conversation I have that's a performance-based conversation with with our interns or some staff that I have, as soon as I get done with that conversation, I'm checking myself and thinking, what could I have done better? How do you, does that, do you do it? Is that a similar thing for you? Are you yeah, constantly yeah. kind of, yeah, how do you keep that? How do you keep that in check? Because I think in, younger years that can seem really self-defeating or really um, demotivating. I've figured out a way for me to really turn that into a very motivational, like, okay, so next time let's write a few things down and we'll do them better. Every in, every year, year our internship's better than it was the year before because I do those checks. But how do you do that process? You know, I, I, I similar to you, I think, you know, it, it came with age more than anything I've done. Um, you know, just the experience of, you know, life didn't end when I did that dumb thing or when I forgot that thing. And guess what? Maybe doing things two ways, uh, gave, you know, thinking of a new way to do something the minute you're finished with something, you can use that the next time you're doing that. Or um, doing the, doing like in math, you know, there's always 10 different ways to do a lot of the things I'm doing. Um, part of the fun is figuring out all 10 of them. And guess what? You know, you don't have time to do all 10 of them. You might have time to do three. <laughs> And then when you do three, you might think of a fourth one that's really cool. You don't have time for now, but you might remember that next time. And um, but I know it can be frustrating. Like I'll, I'll go back to the karate example. I'm not very good at it, and so um, and the and the, I, I have excellent teachers, um, a, a, a leading our, our our gym there, and and um, they they're sensitive to when I'm mad at myself. Um, and it took them a while to figure out that I'm not mad when I'm doing something for the first time and I can't do it. I'm mad when I've done something before and now I can't do it. Or I've done something seven times, I'm not getting any better. <laughs> and so the fact that, you know, my 14-year-old kid can spin around in a circle and kick really hard, you know, I look at that and go, that's awesome. Wish I could do that. But I'm not mad that I couldn't do it yet. I'm not 14 anymore. And uh, um, and so I, I know that if I keep practicing, I'll get better at it. But um, so it's different from competition in that sense. I don't look at cues at people around me and think, oh, I'm falling behind. I, it's more about uh, just myself, you know, not focusing enough and on, on, on constantly kind of getting a little bit better. Um, that's, it's a, it's a little nagging voice. That's a little hard to put up with sometimes. Um, luckily I'm so busy that usually I, I get distracted <laughs> and, and it goes away until yeah. I'm until, in fact, I used to have this really long commute when I would drive home and I would kind of stew a little bit, but now I don't, you know, I ride my bike home and I'm just, I spend all my time home not, trying not to get hit by a car. That's really distracting. It's great. Um, so that I, I don't, I, I don't, come up with those things right you know i learned to take notes and and sometimes i look at those notes and go you know that it really wasn't that great an idea i didn't really need to get that mad at myself for not thinking of it because you know it just no just right there. on jim i i think you're you're right on and the point that that self-reflection has to turn positive in a way especially when you're thinking about okay how can i do this better it is easy to let that go negative and to kind of grind oh, you very, and right and i think that's one of those maturity aspects where we have to be able to recognize that we're having that con I used to call these, you know, a cassette tape, you know, I would replay the conversation over and over and over back in those days, you know, just, and I had to recognize that I was doing that, right? I had to say, okay, I'm being self-critical. I need to turn yeah. that into a positive. What am I going to do to fix it? And if I can't control it, I need to let it go. I you know? know we're a little short on time, but do, you know where really, I, I take it back. Time was one thing. The other thing that really taught me was having kids. Mm -hmm. Um, because when they're hard on themselves, I get mad at them for being hard on themselves. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, they'll do something amazing, and then they'll screw up one tiny thing, and that's all they'll think about. And, 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 and so reorienting them has actually helped me a lot. Um, so I suppose anybody out there who's a coach, you know, you probably already figured this out, you know, even if you don't already have kids because you've done it yourself like that too. You know, when you see it, somebody else do it, you think, well, that's just a silly little thing that, that's bugging them. But, you know, if I had done it, I would have bugged me too. And, uh, and that, that awareness was pretty useful. That's huge, I think, especially for Maximizer, when you've got that that understanding, that sort of litmus test going on all the time for everybody else. Just would you, how would you feel if this was someone else and you were observing it? Yeah. Oh. 
Yeah, and leaders don't don't confuse that with criticism. By the way, maximizer and criticism, right? It's they're, they're two separate things, and people want that honest feedback, and they want it from you. And so don't don't feel like I mean, bring that as a leader and having maximizer, use that to your advantage and use it to their advantage. And you've got to work really hard to bring that to them appropriately. But they want they actually want that. People want to change for the better. And so when you have those, when, when you just lay down as a leader and when people are messing up and you just lay down, you don't, you're not helping them. And they're, you're a leader because they want your help. In fact, it's more so, true than it used to be. They want that development. They want that feedback, um, especially when you're in your first, uh, early in your career. You don't, how are you supposed to know if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and how well you're doing it unless somebody tells you? Um, you know, self-awareness is hard enough for people who've been doing something, something for a long time. You know, we're still, we're all a little biased on, on observing ourselves. Um, you, we all need that. And, and especially if you're leading uh, people who are early in their career, you're really doing them a favor if you, if you provide that pretty frequently. Yeah, no, right on. Micah, we're at the end of our time. Do you have anything you want to wrap this with? I can't believe I just had so much fun talking about math. <laughs> Mind blown, Jim and Jim. Thank you. Uh, I think when we think about Maximizer, what I want to leave us with is you do you do others such a service by helping them see what better can look like. And just like the same with all, all the rest of these 34 themes, I think it's important to realize that other people aren't seeing those things that you're seeing. And right. you are you are opening up a world of possibility for folks if you can find the right way to share it. Uh, I, I don't know what a cassette tape is. I think I'm too young, maybe. Sorry, but, that was uh, a big reference. <laughs> I apologize for bringing that in. I'm kidding. I appreciate Jim's note that you do need those those new young bucks like me to help you keep thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, for I'll, have, I'll maximize that and not it I'll say it. when you're replaying it on yeah. your on your phone. It just auto replays. <laughs> I don't have to do that, do I? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Jim, thanks for giving us such a, a, a purposeful and effective view of the power of all five of your themes together. I think we got to see a lot of analytical, a lot of that super cool combination of ideation and strategic objective of Maximizer that helped us see the value of, of what it brings to the table for other people. So thanks so much for joining us. Hey, anytime. This is fun. Yeah, good having you on, Jim. Hang tight for one second. I will do what I uh, what I consider my maximizer here as we read the uh, the ending script, which is always tons of fun. We'll remind everyone to take full advantage of all the resources we have available at the Gallup Strength Center, gallupstrengthcenter.com. Send us your questions or comments if you'd like to be a guest blogger. We will consider that as well. We're looking for blogs, four to 600 words, original content in nature, something around that uh, it needs to be strengths related from that standpoint. If you got that idea in your head, type it out, send it to it uh, to send it to us, coaching at gallup.com, and put a guest blogger in the subject line, and that will make it to Mike and we will consider it. You can also catch the recorded version of audio of the audio and video via YouTube as, all as, as well as the past shows are available on our resources page on our coach's blog. You can go to coaching.gallup.com. If you're interested in becoming a Gallup Certified Strengths Coach, you can do that as well. We have a, a list of all our courses available that lead to certification on our courses site, just courses.gallup.com. Don't forget the the uh, the Clifton Strengths Summit is coming up as well. We just have Three months uh, till that, uh, till we're here to, uh, together, July 17th, 18th, and 19th of 2017. If you're listening, we have another one coming up in 18 and 19 as well. But mm -hmm. uh, get information on our summit. Uh, it's available at Clifton Strength Summit, all one word, dot com. If you found this helpful, and why wouldn't you? We'd ask that you'd share it. I want to thank everyone for coming out today. And with that, we'll say goodbye, everybody.